You're listening to Church Unlimited Sermon of the Week online. For more information, please visit our website or our church app. We hope you enjoyed today's message by Alan Parfit. This morning, we continue in our series entitled Run Your Race. And I do believe that prophetically, this is also a statement to urge us on as a church community. That uh, this is not time to actually slow down. It's not time to lock down. It's not time to slow down. But this is the time to gear up ourselves to run even faster than ever before. So that's the motive behind the series. And in the series, we're using the term run your race. And biblically speaking, the race describes God's purposes and plans for you your individual unique purposes and plans that God has set out for you to complete in your lifespan. And so when we say run your race, it's about running in such a way that you will fulfill the things God has called you to do. And so the book of Hebrews is the book that's got this wonderful verse that encapsulates this whole thing of not growing weary, not giving up, not pulling out of the race, not going on detours, but the whole letter to the Hebrews is written about encouraging Christians in difficult times to actually keep running for the end goal, the purposes of God for your life. And so I want to read the scripture that is the scripture central to this whole series, and it's Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. I'd love you to open your Bible there. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. And there's a great reason why we should keep on running, given in here that I want to focus on today. It's in verse 1, and it talks about this great cloud of witnesses. If you've still got your Bible open, you'll see it there. And it talks about this cloud of witnesses. And this cloud of witnesses refers to people that have gone before us who are now cheering us on like at a great athletics event and you've got this great crowd all around and it's now your turn to run and there's this great crowd that is urging us on, the crowd of the people of faith from times before that are saying to us in our day, it's your turn, run your race. And so I've entitled this morning's message, Running for the Crowd, or Run for the Crowd, and it refers to not the crowd of popularity, but the crowd of the people of faith that have gone before us. It's a concept that perhaps sometimes we neglect to actually draw into our motivation for running for Jesus, is we need to bring into our minds not just the fact that I'm running for Jesus, but I'm also running because of those that have gone before us, that have fought battles so that I can run my race in my day. And so we're going to be looking at this in this series. And so we've got to ask this question, who is this crowd? And uh, the chapter that we, the verse that we read, chapter 12, starts with the words, therefore, which links it to the previous chapter. And so this great crowd is referenced in Hebrews chapter 11. If you know the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11 is the icon chapter of the heroes of the faith from Israel's history. And it goes through this list of people, the spiritual heroes in Israel's history. And it says, because of them, we must run well now. And when you look at this list in Hebrews chapter 11, you'll find it's very interesting. You'll find moms in there, in the list. You'll find dads. You'll find sinners, murderers, prostitutes, liars in the list. You will find weak people, old people, old Jacob in his age, uh, well into his aged years, leaning on his staff. He's in the list. There's young people. 
And they are called witnesses. That word witnesses means that they are active today. They're not spectators. They're actually witnessing to us in our day. And they are not just spectators watching us. They are actually influencing our lives with their testimony that's witnessing to us today. And so they are actually shouting at us. Not in a bad way. They are shouting the following. This is what I, I want to put in words, what this crowd is shouting to you and me today. They say, saying, we are weak, but by faith we finished our race. You can too. I want to just repeat that. We are weak people, but by faith we finished our race. You can too. So run your race. This is what they are shouting at us as God's people today. And what are they actually showing us? What are they what is the message that they bring to us? Which is really what I want to focus on today. And when you read through Hebrews 11, you see these weak people, but they had a special kind of faith that I want to give a name to. It's not named like that, but I want to give it a name. I want to call it enduring faith. It's a special kind of faith. One can look at faith in different kind of descriptions. You know, you need faith to be saved, to become a Christian. You've got to believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world and to believe him. And by putting your faith in that, you get saved. I want to say that's the faith that gets you onto the racetrack. That's the faith that gets you into the race. But you need a different kind of faith to finish the race. And that's the faith that Hebrews 11 speaks about. And so, in this list of what this great crowd of people did and what their lives were like, we found that they had enduring faith to go through suffering. Suffering is a key thing in Hebrews 11. When you read there, all of them went through suffering. So in other words, enduring faith is the kind of faith that when your racetrack that you're running on goes through easy times, you don't so much need enduring faith. Because, it's, you know, the wind's at your back. You know, the sun's shining gently down upon you and everything is wonderful. And it's a lot lovely to serve Jesus and you can just cruise along down your racetrack. But then there come days and they will come. We know that. Some of you are in the thick of it right now. There come those days where it just seems like, oh God, how on earth can you expect me to run this track? I mean, just look at the heels and the troubles and the dangers and everything in it. Lord, I prefer an easier track. It's in those days that one needs enduring faith. And I must say today, by and large, there are many Christians that I come across that and hear about that seem to lack in the area of enduring faith. You take husbands. You know, they stand at the, at the, at the altar with their wife that they believe God's blessed me with this wonderful woman and here we are and I commit to love you for richer or for poorer till death do us part. I commit to that. And then they run this race and for the first while it's fantastic, easy going. And then the marriage hits some rocky paths along the way. And then suddenly you find husbands saying, no, I'm not called for this. And they want to bail out. And yet they made a vow before God to say, this is my spouse and I will contend for her. I will protect her. I will walk with her through this life. And we just see enduring faith is just not to be found. And so we find it rife in all kinds of areas in our lives. We need enduring faith more than ever in our day. So what is the nature of enduring faith? I think there's a couple of things that we can learn from Hebrews 11. And I want to I go through it. But I want to say something that might be a little bit disturbing to you, but it's true. Is that just the fact that you are a Christian doesn't mean that you will finish your race. And by that I'm not talking about losing your salvation. I'm talking about there's not a guarantee just because you're a Christian that you are going to finish the task God has given to you. We can read about it cases in the New Testament of those that abandoned their race before they'd finished. And so we need to understand that we need a certain kind of faith that's going to keep us finished. We cannot live in the space where we think, just because I'm a Christian, God's going to just make sure that I finish my race. No, we have to understand, saving faith gets us in, but enduring faith will get us to the finish line. We need it. So what are its components? What are the components of enduring faith that I'd like to share with you out of Hebrews 11? There's a whole lot of them, five or six or seven. I'll see how many I can get through. But these are things that describe enduring faith. And I want you throughout the time to ask yourself, what's the level of my enduring faith 
the faith to go through suffering, the faith to go through hard times, and the faith to finish my race. How am I doing on that? And at the end, we're going to have communion where we look to the author of our faith to come to strengthen us as we look to the cross to strengthen our faith for this race that we're on. Okay, so we're going to go through a number of things. So these are some of the components I find in Hebrews 11 of what makes up enduring faith, faith to finish the race. The first thing, it's the kind of faith that is for the not yet visible. Enduring faith is the faith you need for that which you do not yet see. I want to read to you Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. Here it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So it talks of faith of the not yet seen. It talks about how God commended them because they had faith for what they did not yet see. I want to give you an example of somebody you know well. Louis Nell. Louis Nell is one of the elders in our church. And I, I could have used many others, but, but as I was thinking of a, a person that I can see has lived this thing of living for the not yet seen, I think of Louis. Louis Nell was an engineer, chemical engineer, doing well. And he and I spoke. And I said, actually, I want you to come full-time into the ministry, to be a full-time elder with me. This was many, many years ago. At that point in our church's history, we had no building, no property, no money in the bank, really. We were meeting in a school hall, a crowd of people, and he looked at this, secure job, good income, great future, promotions in store, all those kind of things lay ahead of him, and he went and he resigned. He came full time. He saw something. What was visible at that stage was a bunch of wonderful people in a school hall. That was all that made up our church. There was nothing else. That was it. No security, no guarantees, but he saw something. Gave up his job, came full time. As he started to, to work into the life of the church, his previous company kept phoning him for months afterwards, saying, hey, you know, we, we're battling without you. Can you come back? Don't you rather want to reconsider? Don't you want to become like a consultant? Or they offered him all kinds of things. And I remember in those times, time and time again, he just says, I'm not going back. I see something here. And he didn't know about what was going to happen in Mozambique, the work that he's done there. He didn't know what was going to happen in the children's ministry that he took from where it was in that place and has built an incredible children's ministry. He didn't know any of that. It wasn't visible at that time. But he saw something. He caught a glimpse of it. And he ran his race. And God began to open doors for him. And the work in Mozambique is a phenomenal work. How years and years and years he's seen numerous churches planted, countless people come to Christ, teams of leaders built up in that area over years. And it's incredible just to see. You see, enduring faith. It's a faith for the not yet seen. I think for parents, this is a particularly important one. You know, sometimes we look at our children and God for a moment gives us a glimmer of what their race looks like. And then we look at their lives and they right in our face and they're all over the show. And yet we've seen that. And we've seen moms whose children are seemingly all over the show, but they've seen something of a future that God has for their children. And they're on their knees, enduring in prayer, enduring in faith. Why? Because they've seen something. They've seen something of what their children have been called to live for. No matter what the curveballs come in their lives, we see parents, dads on their knees saying, but God, I see this. And they endure, and they endure, and they endure. We will see it. And there'll come a day where you don't need that faith for that anymore because it will be visible. And they start to live in it. And then you don't need the faith anymore for that. You need it for other things because enduring faith is for the not yet visible. Second one I want to talk about, an aspect of enduring faith, 
It's a faith that talks about drawing near to God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, I'd like to read that to you. It says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And in this passage that I've just read, there are some words I want to highlight. There are three things that it says enduring faith is inspired by. And I, I, I want to use that word, it inspires, it invigorates enduring faith. Three things. The one is that I have the, the, the conviction in my heart that it is possible for me as a weak human being to please God. That might sound funny to you, but you know what it is for a human being that's full of weakness to believe, you know what, I can please God with my life. It's one of the things that inspires me. The fact that I can live my life and I will bring pleasure to God through my life. And through the things that I do and through running faithfully, I can bring pleasure to God. The second thing that I see there is that it speaks about that I can come near to Him. It says that because anyone who comes to Him must believe. Faith says, you know what? Sometimes God's going to feel a hundred miles from me when I'm running this race. It's going to feel like, God, where are you? How can all this be happening to me? But the enduring faith says, I know I can come to him. Even if he doesn't feel close, I know by the cross of Jesus Christ, I can always come to him. And the third thing that it shows me, it says that if I look for him, he will let me find him. And that thing inspires my faith. Sometimes in my life, I just think, oh God, where are you? But this kicks in, saying, Lord, I know you've promised that if I seek you diligently, I will find you. And I'm going to carry on running my race because I know that you're a God has promised that down this track, I'm going to find you again. Even if for a time you've chosen to make yourself seem distant, he's never distant. But sometimes God will allow our faith to be tested by almost letting us experience as though he's far away, but he isn't. But it'll feel like that so that enduring faith can grow in us. That we don't always have this deep assurance of his presence. Sometimes, God, where are you? But enduring faith says, Lord, I know I'll find you. Down this track of living out your purposes, I will meet you again because you've promised. It's the nature of enduring faith. Jesus said, I always live to please my Father. You know what that means to me? It's one of the most powerful truths to say, you know what? I want to live my life in such a way that I know my race is pleasing to him. And I think it's modeled by Christ. It was his motivation for everything he did, even when he went through incredible suffering. He says, you know what, I live to please him. And we have to ask ourselves this question, whose pleasure are you living for? I want you to ask yourself in honesty in your life, whose pleasure are you living for predominantly? Not as this little side uh, job that you're busy with. But the main part of your life is for another pleasure. But I want to ask you, whose pleasure? Jesus lived every day for the pleasure of his Father. And enduring faith is inspired by this truth, that if I live my life and run the race God's called me to, I will find his pleasure every moment of every day as I run that race. Now I want to just linger on this for a moment. The pleasure of God, I believe, is linked directly to the joy of God that we experience in our lives. And so it's something to consider about the joy of the Lord. I believe the joy of the Lord, I'm not talking about happiness. Happiness is punted as this ultimate thing everybody must strive for. I'm talking of joy, the joy of the Lord. It's directly linked to living to please Him. Because it means I find such joy in the fact that I can please Him. And that's where I live. I don't want to venture off this race into other things that look more pleasurable. But I know that they will not bring pleasure to Him. I live for the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. What that means is I'm not living for happiness. I'm living to just be under the continual sense of the pleasure of God. Whose joy... Or whose pleasure, rather, are you running for? Are you running for the deep assurance that you live to please Him? Or are you running for some other things? The next aspect 
of enduring faith I'd like to refer to is that it's a kind of faith that has a conviction that God rewards. I know it's a controversial subject, but un unfortunately the Bible doesn't actually uh, worry too much if uh, things are a bit uh, controversial. The Bible is full of controversial things, and one of them is this thing of reward. I want to talk about it briefly, but the Bible is full of the truth that we are to run our race for a prize. You'll find Paul writing about it, the writer to the Hebrews says, run, because there's a finish line, there's a reward, run for it. These heroes of the faith of Hebrews 11, they saw a prize, they saw a reward. Now, some people say, well, my reward is Jesus. I want to say no, because Paul said, Jesus has his reward with him. So in other words, I run for Jesus, but he's got a reward with him as well. We mustn't just say, well, I just run for Jesus. No, Jesus is pleased when he says, live like this and my Father will reward you. He's pleased for us to run with the sense, I want to run for the pleasure of being rewarded by Christ for my race. And this is something I think can leave people unmotivated when they think, you know what, I'm saved, I'm a Christian, I've got Jesus. And so really what I do with the rest of my life doesn't really matter that much. I want to say, you go and read the Bible and see Jesus is run in such a way as to win the prize. We can't win Jesus. He wasn't talking about getting him as the prize. Yes, ultimately we run for him above all else. He also says run in such a way as to win the prize, as to get to the end, to hear him say, well done, you finished your race. We run for that. There's somebody that, whose life's testimony is not as ancient as, as the ones in Hebrews 11, but it's a lady who has inspired my wife and I many, many times. Her name is Corrie ten Boom. She grew up as a Dutch girl and a Christian family, and they, during World War II, they used their home as a hiding place for Jews to escape from the Nazis. And they used to hide them in their home. They made a movie about her called The Hiding Place. And then they were caught out, and her whole family was sent to Ravensbrück and other concentration camps. She lost her entire family. Her whole family died in the concentration camp. Only she survived. And when they made this movie of her life, she was in her 80s when they made the movie. So obviously there was an actress who was acting in her role in the movie. But at the end of the movie, they did a little clip of the real Corrie ten Boom. She speaks at the end of the movie. She's in her 80s. And when you look at this clip of her speaking, she sits down in her lounge, puts her hand on her Bible, and as this 80-year-old, she exudes faith. She's lost everything. She exudes faith. There's such a joy in her, such a faith in her. I listen to her voice. We weep. And these are the words, famous words of hers. I want to read that she, she speaks at the end of the movie. She says this, No pit is so deep that he is not deeper still. With Jesus, even in our darkest moments, the best remains and the very best is yet to come. She had this concept of this great reward and it inspired her right to the very end of her life. There are many folk in Church Unlimited who are in their later years they inspire me with their faith. They stir me. I want to ask, even here today, you look around, and I, I don't want to put anybody in the spot, but you look around, there's some gray hairs here. <laughs> I want to commend you. I want to applaud you. I want to ask Church Unlimited to applaud you for your faith. You are inspiring us with your faith. We want to say, well done. Keep going. Run to the end because your faith is drawing us on, inspiring us. We applaud you for that. Another aspect of enduring faith. It's a faith that stands on the fact that God speaks and leads us in this life. It's not a faith 
that just says, well, what will be, will be. Just kind of casting myself off on, you know, God will make everything kind of work out. It's a faith that says, God will speak to me and I can stand on his word and on his promises and he will lead me. It needs a particular kind of faith. Some people abandon this. They don't like the fact that God still speaks today. But I think of Noah, that you read of in Hebrews 11, one of the heroes. I mean, he was doing his whole life normally carrying on, good man. And God said, build an ark. I don't know, I've forgotten how long it took Noah, but it was long to build that ark. In my mind, he changed the whole course of his life because God spoke. And here he was sawing and hammering away, month in, month out, not a cloud in the sky. People walking past, neighbors must be scoffing at him, all those kind of things we could imagine might have been going on. There he is, month in, month out, month out. Abraham, God says, leave your town, take your family, and go. I'm not going to tell you where yet, but go there, sort of. His whole life changed because God spoke. Mary is wandering through the wilderness with his family. People ask him, where are you going? I'm not too sure. Going somewhere, but God spoke. And somewhere here, there's going to be an inheritance. And you know, inheritance. It only came later in his descendants. But he went there because God spoke. When we ordain people on eldership, just use this as an example. The build up to that, one of the critical points before we will get even close to ordination is I will ask them, what does God say to you about being a pastor in this church? And the reason I say that to them is this, is because the race of running as an elder, sometimes it's great. Sometimes it hits the most difficult roads you can imagine. Roads filled with the sorrow of what people are going through. Roads filled with the, the heartache of seeing people giving up so easily. The heartbreak of seeing families broken up for, for all kinds of, of wrong reasons. And, and so we go on. And so there come days where the, the race of running as a pastor is filled with difficulties. And it's in, in those times where you need to be able to say, but what did God say? as you hammering away, sawing away, no cloud in the sky. What did God say? God said, build an ark. Enduring faith stands on the promises of God. God promised. I don't see the promise yet, but he said so. He will lead me on, and it stands on that, standing on the promises of God. The next one, I want to read a particular scripture here. And it says here in Hebrews 11, verse 10, For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now, I'm sparing the detail of all of what happened prior to that verse, but it talks of one of the great heroes of the faith who saw a city, it says, that God would design and God was building. Enduring faith, sees the city of what God is building. And what I want to tell you a little bit about this, what this means is that enduring faith is inspired when we somehow catch a glimpse of the great project that God is building throughout history on this earth. What God is building, His redemptive plan for humanity. And when we see that, that is like a glimpse of the city that God is building, God's redemptive plan for humanity. When we see that, and then we see God saying, come and build with me, that thing triggers enduring faith. Because I no longer see myself just as a random adventurer of the faith, just strutting around and doing a couple of great things for Jesus. But I see myself as a strategic part of the great building that God is building on the planet. He's building a people of God. And when I see myself as part of that building project, you know how strongly that urges me to keep running. Because I'm not building something just for my lifetime. 
And I'm not building something that just started in my lifetime either. I'm building something that for years and years and years and centuries, God has been building with these heroes of the faith. They've been building almost like this great wall around us. We've been building and some built a piece. Now it's my turn and I'm building a piece of the wall, but it's not some isolated little shack that I'm putting up somewhere. It's part of this great city. And what it means that when finally the trumpet sounds and Jesus returns and the building is finished, he's going to say, that little piece, hey, you build, come and share in my reward of the whole project. Sounds like we're building some stuff here. We want everybody in Church Unlimited to be able to say, but we were part of the building in that sense. That we are those that can share in the finish product because we were part of the building process. Enduring faith sees the city and then embraces the opportunity to be a co-worker with Christ to see it built. So I want to ask you a question today. Why did you say your life is contributing to the eternal building project of God? Would you consider that this morning? What is your life contributing to the eternal building project of God? Because sometimes we can look and we can see, well, my life's contributing to the profitability of this company or my life's contributing to the success of, of my business or my life's contributing. We can do all kinds of things that we can see our life is contributing for. And I'm not against those things, but I want to ask you, in the scope of eternity, what is your life contributing to the city of God? Are the eternal things being built into place through your life? Because that is the ground for enduring faith. Number six. Enduring faith stands on the faithfulness of the one who speaks. I'll be very brief with this one, but it is one of the most personally encouraging truths for me. It comes from the life of Sarah in the Old Testament. I want to read to you about her. It says, Sarah herself was barren, Hebrews 11, 11. But, and, and Abraham, her husband. But it says, they considered God faithful who made the promise. There's a big difference between the promise and the promise maker. And they saw that. They had the promise. But the promise was not visible. It wasn't there. Where is this promise of a child that God promised and to be the father of many nations that God promised? And there was nothing. So the promise was there, but the promise itself wasn't what their focus was on. They held on to the promise because they saw past the promise, the promise maker. And they said, but he is faithful. Therefore, his promise is reliable. And it is something that enduring faith is inspired by because there's sometimes we feel, oh God, I felt you promised me this. But you, I'm so struggling to hold on to the promise. And in those times, God will say, but look past the promise to the promise maker. And we see, oh God, but you are faithful. And then my enduring faith is strengthened. Number seven. The last one, I think. Yep, last one. Number seven. Enduring faith is focused not on easy prosperity or on escape from suffering. I need to mention this because I started like this. But it talks of Moses in Hebrews 11, 25, and it says he chose to be mistreated. I want to just repeat that little piece. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God. That is something that is common in our day. We generally choose the path that's easiest, the least discomfort, and the least trouble. And we say, okay, that must be the will of God, surely. Moses had a path like that. He could just stay there in Pharaoh's palace. He had a great inheritance, great promotion opportunities. But it says he chose to be mistreated. And it says there, he did it rather to be mistreated rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. 
Something we need to hear in our day. There's a path there that's got pleasures for now, but it's not God's race for you. And when we run a race that's not God, it's sinful. Run down that road. Moses said, well, this path looks horrible. It's dreadful. I'm going to be mistreated. This path looks amazing. I choose this one. You see, that's what enduring faith is. That doesn't mean we're always going to be, you know, these poor martyrs. But when I get a crossroad, and the one path easy and the other path's hard, I ask first, before I just say the easy path must be God, I ask first, Lord, what is your race for me? If it's this one, I go down that race. And for some, it could be going into a wrong relationship. Because this looks amazing. Just think of all the wonderful things I can get out of this relationship. And God says, no, that's not my path for you. But Lord, this road seems, I might be lonely down this road. It might be hard. I might be on my own. Choose this one, because that's where God's race is. That particular. So I ask myself that question. There's a lot of things that kind of get subtly said, even amongst Christians, or among Christians. It goes like this. The one with the most faith is the one that has got the easiest life. We offer don't say it, but we think it. And we put the bumper stickers on our new car. Blessed by God. We've got to be careful what subtly it's saying. Is that the one with the great faith is going to have the easy life. And the one poor sucker that's battling through life is the one that didn't have enough faith. We've got to be careful. It's not an absolute truth, but we've got to be careful because there can come times where we say, oh, I'm going to choose this road and it's going to be a battle and I'm going to have trouble, but it's my race and I'll choose that one. We think of Peter and Paul in the New Testament, for example. Peter goes to prison. They pray. The prison opens up and he walks free. We say, sure, it's because of his faith. Sometime later, Paul goes to prison. He never gets out. He dies there. Both of those needed faith. Sometimes faith will get us out of suffering. Sometimes enduring faith will take us through suffering. We've got to realize this. We cannot have this glib thing that if I've got faith, life's going to be easy. It might not. It might be. It might not be. So bringing this to a conclusion, I want to end with two things. The first is that your life is also becoming a life that will form part of the crowd of others. I want you to think about that. Your life that you're running right now is also going to be part of this great crowd. And in particular, parents, you are part of the crowd of witnesses for your children. How you run your race is not a private matter. Your children are watching. And your life is witnessing to them. Run your race for their sake. Your colleagues at work, they're watching your life. They're watching your race. You are part of the crowd of witnesses for them. Run your race. That's the first thing. The second thing, the greatest hero of the race is Jesus. We read it in the opening verses. I want to read it again as we prepare for communion. Because when we look at this thing of faith, we say, Lord, how can I get it? Well, there's the author and the perfecter who's here today, Jesus Christ. And through the cross, he will come alongside you. He will strengthen your faith that you can endure. And that's what we're going to have communion to focus on today. Let me read those verses again this, that we read right at the beginning. Hebrews chapter 12. But I'll just start in verse 2. It says there, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. In other words, we have this great assurance 
that Jesus Christ, who ran his race, isn't waiting at the finish line. But he's coming alongside you and me. And he's going to inspire, strengthen, perfect our faith in the race as we run. And that's what communion reminds us of. He went to the cross, but he's here now that we can draw faith. I need you to get your communion ready. Maybe you'd be comfortable to close your eyes. Just, because we want to really just let our whole being focus on Christ. We want our hearts to be prepared as we take communion. So won't you just focus on him? And I want to read this verse as you do. It says, looking to Jesus. Won't you do that right now? Look to him. The founder and the perfecter of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and he seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Would you consider him now? I'm going to pray and then I'm going to just invite you to there, just to be consumed with the wonder of Jesus, the author and perfect of your faith. Lord Jesus, we look to you as a church community. You are our champion. You are the author and perfect of our faith. You have run your race which took you through the cross, but you went through it for the joy set before you. Would you come to us today, even as we have communion, and strengthen our faith Make an enduring faith for the race that lies ahead of each one of us. As we remember your death, as we remember your blood, as we remember your resurrection, and as we remember that you are here with us, alive, to enable us, each one, to finish our race because of you. In Jesus' name, we honor you. Thank you, Lord. Please, would you go ahead have communion, just worship him. I'll ask if they can maybe just put some soft music on for us, guys, if you could. If we just take some time to have communion together. Lord Jesus, we bow before you, our hero, above all else. We want to say thank you, Jesus, for the cross. We remember how terrible it must have been for you. And we want to say thank you, Lord. But we also want to draw on the power that you gave through the cross to us to run our race. We want to draw on that today as we pray to you, author and finisher of our faith. Would you come upon us by your spirit? Strengthen your servants who are the ones running at this time. They are those that have run before us. There are those that will run after us. But we're running now. Lord, would you come upon us by your Spirit. Strengthen us. Inspire us. Invigorate us. Accelerate us into the race that you've marked out for us. By the power of the cross and the wonderful grace that you release through your shed blood. In Jesus' name, we pray. Before we close, one last thing. If you're hearing this message, and you do not know this incredible Savior, Jesus Christ, as your personal Lord and Savior. I want to pray a prayer for you, that you can pray with me. If you are convinced that you want to give your life to Him today, short prayer, pray this prayer, and then I'm going to invite you to come up to the front afterwards if you want to. And one of our folk would love to chat to you and pray with you. If you'd like to give your life to Christ, pray this prayer now. Lord Jesus Christ, 
You are the only Savior of the world. I believe that you died for me on the cross. So today I repent of living my own life, a sinful life, and I turn my life over to live for you. Will you come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and be my Lord and my Savior? Forgive me of my sins and let me belong to you from this day on, I pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.